Alrighty, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, it's now time to talk about your week number four lecture. And of course, your written test number one, more like a midterm, is going to take place uh, next week. I'll talk about it uh, briefly, just about the resources you're given. Uh, as, you, as usual, I'm going to talk about announcement, and then I will go over the Google Doc questions. And since you got your written test number one next uh, Monday or Tuesday, right? You should really refer to your test guide. We'll see how, how many questions you might have today. I will definitely go over the Google Doc questions. You can also ask me on the fly as well. If that should really uh, uh, exhaust the entire session, in that case, I will talk about the extra linkless uh, problem which I posted earlier this afternoon. Uh, maybe I can talk about a solution tomorrow. We'll see. If we can manage to talk, uh, finish talking about a solution of the extra problem today, I can give another problem tomorrow, right? So that will be to your benefit as well. We'll see how that goes. Already, uh, let's talk about announcement quickly before we uh, dive into the technical contents, right? So you have received quite a good number of announcements from me today, but, but nothing is unimportant. Let's talk about it quickly. Your written test number one, which will take place online uh, over E-class, right? Written test number one is going to be on E-class, right? It will be due next Monday or Tuesday for the precise time I would like you to refer to the, te uh, the test guide. However, I really want to open that document together with you because I think uh, uh, I decided to revise the start time of your written test one. It was brought to my attention that if we start the test right after the beginning of the, uh, the class, for those of you who may, uh, who may have to come to campus, maybe for other in-person uh, maybe session right before that particular start time. In that case, maybe it would be more convenient if you start a little bit later so that you can just get yourself set up. I think that that's a fair request. So that's why I decided to revise that for everybody, right? Let me just show it to you quickly. So if you go to the lectures page and then go under week number three, right? That's the PDF you should have already read about the test guide. I'm going to leave that to you. It got the important policy and also coverage, etc. right? But if you review, uh, if you re, uh, download the document again, and ref make sure you fre uh, refresh your browser, right? The starting time has been changed, but the duration is the same, still 30 minutes. And the whole duration of your test is still within the scheduled uh, class time, either on Monday or Tuesday, right? So the policy is still the same. Just the start time is about, uh, it's exactly 30 minutes uh, after the original one, just to let you know, right? Hopefully that will uh, to the benefits for many of you, all right? And I'll try to keep this uh, start time hopefully consistent at least for the next written test. For your programming test that's going to come uh, uh, after the reading week, because the programming test will actually last for 90 minutes. So I will see what I can do. Either I can maybe reduce uh, the duration for the test, in which case, of course, I will reduce the, uh, the difficulty for the test as well. We'll see how that goes. But one thing at a time, for your coming written test number one uh, next week, Make sure you actually uh, know about the new start time, right? Make sure, all right? And that'll be online, right? Okay, so that's the uh, first thing I'd like to talk about. And also, you got some example question on the E-class, right? You also received an announcement from me earlier today. Let me just show to you how you can get access to it. If you go to the E-class, and then you can see under written tests over here, right? You can see there's a link, example question on written test number one. And next Monday or Tuesday, right before the uh, schedule start time for your test, you will see another two links. So one is for completing the academic honesty pretest, which is required for uh, attempting the actual test. You will see another two links uh, next week. Not now, but next week. Okay, I'll be in touch once they are visible. If you click on that, you will see uh, some example questions. I think uh, some of your fellow students have already tried, right? It's kind of a up to you if you want to try it or not. I think it can give you some idea about uh, uh, some uh, some idea about how the test can be like, right? It, because it's going to be on uh, E-class format, right? Uh, but notice that the test is going to be closed shortly before uh, the Monday's uh, start time of the test, right? So you really got to try as soon as possible. One thing I would like to mention, which you will see as a first question, right, over here. So it's only meant for familiarizing yourself about the format and workflow for the test not really meant to cover all the topics required by the test, meaning that you should really make sure you still prioritize your study for whatever that's really required for the test, right? It's really uh, your responsibility to do that. And also the, the questions there tend to be more on the easier side. So I would say in the actual test, you can 
definitely expect maybe a little bit more questions or maybe harder questions. That's for sure, right? It can, I think that's fair, right? But I think that will give you uh, at least uh, these questions will give you some idea about what may cover it, right? But definitely there can be uh, more that's going to be covered in the test, right? So that's something I'll let, uh, I'll let you mention. Right, let me come back here, right? So that's about your written test number one, okay, for next week. Hopefully everything's clear. And for your assignment number one, which is also due next week, right? So that's been released uh, more than a week already. And if you go to assignment number one instructions, uh, which is not here. So, oh, did I close E-class? I did. Okay. Let me go there again. Okay. I want to show you that assignment instruction just to make sure everybody is clear about the deadline, which is important. All right, if you go to assignment number one instructions over there, you can see this is the single place to look up for the deadline, right? You can see uh, it's going to be due 2 p.m. EST, right? Eastern Time, Toronto Time. And it's going to be next Tuesday, February 15th. So make sure you submit by then. Uh, if you want to see the instruction, you can look at the uh, instruction uh, PDF. It should be rather straightforward for you to submit. All right, that's about the deadline. And uh, also, I announced earlier today, your lecture number five is going to be just postponed for one week, but it's not going to uh, delay any schedule uh, for the semester. Let me just show to you what I meant. If you go to the semester calendar over here, you will see that. So the release time for your lecture week number six will still be uh, on schedule. It will still be the same. It's just that we're actually going to move the release of your lecture number five to on the 16th around over here. But that's okay. But I think uh, for next week, we still we can still hold a Q and A, uh, even though we may not have uh, some new contents to talk about. Maybe you can do some. We can do some extra exercises. Uh, you know, it's a kind of optional for us, right? We can do that. Well, we'll see. And after the reading week, uh, in that in this particular Q and A, in that way, we we'll, we can talk about maybe for week number five and week number six lecture. On average, we don't have that many questions for every lecture, so I think we can handle that. In, in case we cannot. Uh, we'll see how that how that goes. If you really cannot handle all of the questions in the Q and A, we can still host an extra session if necessary. We'll see. All right. That's the minor change. I also want you to get notice over here. All right. So that's about all the announcement I want to uh, talk about. Do you guys have any questions related to uh, the course? Administrative part, of course. Any anybody? You can go ahead. All right, so hopefully everybody is clear about number one, uh, how the test is going to be run next week, and number two, the deadline for your assignment number one. Right, so I think these two are the more uh, the more immediately urgent uh, things you want to look after. Right. Alrighty, hearing none, seeing none. Oh, let me see. So yeah, so Q and A, right. Yeah, I'm gonna write to you guys in to confirm uh, in writing uh, as I said. I'll try uh, since officially on the 14th uh, of February we're gonna return back in person. But I would suggest in the first place we'll still run the Q and A maybe just online over here because that's also what uh, the majority of you uh, your fellow students actually prefer. However, since we actually got two sessions every week, I'm thinking that maybe um, let's wait for maybe a couple of weeks maybe to see how this how this goes. Maybe after the reading week, uh, maybe starting from, for example, not, not really saying it's going to happen, but for example, we can say starting from this particular session, we can either choose maybe um, uh, the th Wednesday afternoon's Q&A or maybe the Thursday morning to be in person. <laughs> maybe most likely the Wednesday uh, afternoon session to be in person so I can uh, have more of you come if you're interested. Otherwise, I think a Thursday morning, we don't have that many people anyway. <laughs> doesn't matter that's in person or not, right? We'll see. Yeah, awesome, right? I'll, I'll be very keen to see you guys, but I would suggest maybe let's uh, watch out, uh, let's watch the situation for maybe uh, a couple of weeks. I think that'll be to our best uh, best interest, right? I think for now, uh, you definitely got all the resources you have, and every time you got questions, just reach out to me, right? And also for Q&A, I think it's quite convenient for everybody to do the Zoom, but I think uh, running the in-person will be beneficial as well. I'll, I'll be in touch with you. I think uh, tentatively, I will definitely consider if we may just start maybe uh with in person uh q a not a test just q a maybe starting from this week we'll see i'll let you know okay and don't worry if uh if you don't uh if the q a uh even though it's going to be uh uh in person it will still be uh it will still be uh recorded 
So yeah, for now, the Q&A will still be online, absolutely. And then until further notice, exactly. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. Alrighty, guys, any more questions? To be honest with you guys, I'm also nervous. I haven't seen a single face of students for uh, more than two years already. So uh, I'm equally nervous as you are. So, uh, but you know, I think it'll be exciting for sure. Alrighty. Okay. Uh, all right. I think that's about it. Uh, if you got any doubts about how the course should be run, please let me know. Let me know. Good. Yeah, I think uh, especially for you guys, I think uh, most likely uh, even starting from your either uh, 10, 15 or maybe your 10, 11, I mean, engineering students, you haven't really reached the campus just yet. Because since you started your first year, you, you have been online. Yeah. Well, uh, it, I can tell you that uh, in person learning is definitely fun, definitely. But of course, now we got a, you know, the the pandemic situation, uh, you know, surrounding us. But I can just tell you, in general, in person learning is fun. You can interact with me, interact with your fellow students, and also other students from other classes. I think it's definitely some experience you cannot miss as an undergrad for sure. We'll see how that goes. All right. Aha! Uh -huh. Awesome. In Bergerell Center, awesome, good. Uh, let's see, if the test become in person, hypothetically, should we expect there to be a difficulty change since academic honesty can be more? Uh, okay, uh, I would say the difficulty might be more or less similar, but of course, if we do run the in-person test, for uh, let's say for written test, for example, the format definitely will be different, right? So I would say, uh, and for sure, your final exam is going to be in person. Uh, I would say don't worry too much about you know uh, the test being run in person. When we get there, I'll, uh, again, as usual, I'll give you some example questions so you can uh, have some idea. Uh -huh. If the tests are still uh, are in person, again, hypothetically, would it still be open book? Guys, I would suggest if you actually got a test uh, in person, I would suggest that to be closed book. Usually, I can almost guarantee, usually, if the uh, the test is a closed book, it will tend to be easier than otherwise, right? Then uh, it's actually open book. It's usually the case. So you don't really want the test or exam to be open book. On, on the other hand, I think uh, for your exam, even though it's going to be uh, in person, our, I think the standard practice, well, not, not, not necessarily every professor would do it, but I think I personally would like to allow students to prepare like a one single uh, page of uh, data sheets. That, that's something I can talk about later. So I think in some way that's a good way to really push you to really put all the important stuff into a single page. There'll be no limitation on how, how small the font size is. You can use a magnifier if you want to uh, when you come to the exam, that's okay. So as long as you can fit in all the information you want into a single page, you can bring it to the exam, right? But that's something I'll talk about. You don't need to worry about for now already. Yeah, the final exam will be for now. Uh, well, the official standing for university will be the exam should be in person, right? As we, uh, as I uh, mentioned to you before, you will be in person. So that means uh, it's going to be on paper, actual paper, meaning that you guys really have to bring pencil and also eraser and also yeah, uh, you will be provided sketch paper usually, so you don't need to bring bring anything extra. And also yeah, I'll, I'll walk you through the process since I know you guys are totally new. To this process, so maybe when get uh, when we're getting closer to the time, I will give you guys some orientation. All right, don't worry. I, I know it's new to you, even though you're in the second year. All right, all right. And for in person classes, well, you know, as I said, yeah, you know, for the lectures will all be pre recorded. That one wouldn't change no matter what. For your Q and A, if we do run some session in person Q and A, hypothetically, I will still record it, so you wouldn't be disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, in the final exam is not exactly interview on the whiteboard, not exactly, but you, you, you will see. I'll give you guys an example. Yeah, later. Yeah, for your first, uh, your first written test, definitely uh, is going to be uh, online, I already confirmed that in the test guide. For your first programming test uh, after the reading week, I will actually, uh, I will confirm with you uh, at least one week in advance, but I can tell you that it's more likely that the programming test will be online, more likely. If it really has to be in person, I'll let you know beforehand because I also need to decide earlier 
because I also need to allocate the room uh, for all of us. But I'll, I'll let you know. All right. All right. Any more questions? You can feel free to put on the chat. I just want to just want to make sure there's no other concern before we go on. Q and A and tests are the only ones to have a chance in person, correct? And all the main week lecture will be online. That's correct. All your weekly lectures will just be like since forever, so they will be pre-recorded, for sure, right? The test on Tuesday, right? So Philip, uh, I would suggest go to the test guide over here. Exactly. So guys, again, you don't really have to take it on the uh, Tuesday 9 a.m. Of course, if you want to, you can feel free. But I'm saying that you can choose either to take it here or you can take it here. I'm going to give uh, different versions for the test uh, in the two. And also, we will actually do a uh, plagiarism check whenever possible. So I think uh, hopefully it's going to be a fair test. So just make sure you uh, if you take it earlier, uh, try, uh, don't talk to anybody about the test. And if you're going to take it later, also make sure you don't talk to anybody else uh, who took it already. Right. You know that the standard uh, procedure you want to watch out. Yeah, but you're right. Either you can take it for 30 p.m. on Monday, your choice, or you can take it 9 a.m. on Tuesday. Right. That's a new start time. Alrighty, any more questions? Any more? Okay, I think we should really get started, right? 20 minutes is uh, enough about talking about this kind of thing. Okay, good. All right, so I think uh, before I move on to the Google Doc question, I think Masato actually got some uh, question just about the notes. Masato, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Jackie, and thank you. Um, so my concern was uh, specifically on uh, slide 32 of slide 32. Let me go there first. Slide. Yes, sure. slide 32. 32. And on that slide, um, it says get element at index i, and it notes the time complexity for that for the singly linked list mm -hmm. as uh, big O of n, right? Yeah. So uh, linear. That's linear. But, Yes, but it, I, I don't know if this is just my misunderstanding or something, but mm -hmm. is, isn't I supposed to refer to a con, like a constant? True, that's true. I should be a constant, you're right. But um, you know what? Uh, th thinking this way, when we say uh, index I over here, right? Index I is more like an input to your method. Remember, we got a method in the singly linked list called a get node at, uh, you know, with, with integer I. So that's the I I'm talking about. Meaning that when people call your method for get note at, they might pass any arbitrary value of I, given that I is actually valid. Meaning that it should be larger than or equal to zero, and also smaller than or equal to the size of the list minus one, right? It's pretty much like the array indices uh, validity constraint. So now over here, you really want to think about what's the worst case. Uh, the worst case, uh... Yeah, you may, you may be thinking about, well, if I is simply, let's say, the last index, in that case, you can just return a tell. That's actually true. But what if I give you, let's say, I, the worst case could be maybe the, uh, the size minus two, meaning that I'm, I'm asking, to, uh, asking you, you to, to give me the second last node in the list. In that case, you have no way but to actually uh, traverse from the head of the list all the way to the, uh, the uh, second last node. In that case, it would be basically a linear time. Hmm. But I, what I was concerned is that, mm -hmm. like, for example, if we take an example for this, for example, accessing mm -hmm. the fifth node, like time complexity of that should not change because no matter how, what, how big your linked list is, because what you're doing that's is true. That's true. essentially but going five nodes down. I, I, agree, I agree with you. So, so the I over here, you're right, in, the, in some special case where I is simply, let's say, equal to zero or equal to one or even... 13 is a constant i agree with you but the problem is we're talking about the worst case the worst case for i could be maybe just a second last note in the list in which case the the list size could be very very large in that case to really get to the second last note it would be linear time do, do you see what i mean oh. let me try to draw uh, i think this is important actually think about just in general if you have your uh, node over here, let me draw it a little bit more simply, just to save time. Okay, first of all, let me just put it over here. 
think about in general this will be the picture right let's say you got one uh second node and you might get all the way to something like that okay let me more, be more precise over here right next and also the next to something over here dot, dot, dot. you can have as many in the middle as possible in general then uh this, this will be the second last so this will be the index of n minus two right this will be n minus one where n is the number of nodes the size of the the chain of nodes and of course uh the next over here would just be null over here and we know that we actually got two references over here we got the head and also we got the tail over here okay and the worst case would be if you actually want to get the this particular second last node this will be the worst case so this will be the worst case this will be the worst case because you will have to you will have to uh somehow run the loop and you have to, you have to run n minus one iterations to really uh get to this particular part so the get next method will be invoked like a pretty much like a n minus one times right and over here since we're talking about arbitrary uh like a linked list in that case n can be very large right so that's why it's going to be big o of n do you kind of follow so far i i do understand but I, i'm still unsure about something because go ahead um um so n is supposed to be the size of the chain right? that's correct and i understand that good and i is supposed to be the index of the uh the uh node that we're trying to ac access right correct but i feel that we're currently like if if we're taking the worst case scenario for i to be to equal n like mm -hmm. and like okay um like i i just don't like i feel that we we might be talking about like big o of i in a way it's like like if i keeps on getting bigger mm -hmm. then yes uh the time complexity will be linear like for every yeah, exactly and remember minority. we're talking about the, uh, the worst case always so that's why the worst case for this would be when i uh so i would be so the worst case definitely will be when i is exactly equal to uh like an n minus two right so this will be the worst case yeah yeah, yeah. but the big like i like from my understanding and from the lectures so mm -hmm. far is that the big o of n means or like the, the big o notation in general means right. the when n the size of the chain increases how does the time increase yes exactly so you'll be proportional so let's say n over here in the case let's say if the size of your list is simply 10 so that's this that that means you will yes. uh, in the worst case you have to uh you have to uh take uh, about 10 invocations off to get next to get there let's say if the n is happened to be 1 million let's say you got 1 million nodes uh in your chain in that case you will need to get uh very close to about 1 million times of the get next in order to get to the second last node so that's really the uh the proportion effects over here mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. but then like i i don't I, like i understand we're trying to go for the worst case scenario but mm -hmm. i don't like i if if my understanding is correct i don't think n like like num when n increases it's i should increase it should automatically increase nope. as well you should think in this way okay i can see you should really see in this way you should think about when n increases okay, let me put it in this way so somehow you are confused about maybe n and also the i over here okay when n increases that means the worst case value for i increases accordingly as well because we know that the formula is simply that the worst case for i is simply n minus 2 so when n actually increases of course n minus 2 also increases right it's uh, actually quite obvious mm -hmm. 
Mm. How about Masato? If you're still a little bit confused, why don't you think a little bit more? So I'll be more than happy to carry this conversation with you. Maybe we can uh, uh, talk about this over office hour, and that we can uh, see some additional examples as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay. No problem. All right. So ex. Uh, in addition to Masada, I want everybody to know that I think uh, it's good that Masada pointed out this table over here. I think this table is very important for your written test number one, right? Well, I wouldn't say you have to memorize it because just memorizing it, I don't think it would be enough to really answer questions in the test. I wouldn't just uh, blank, uh, just blank, uh, blank a few uh, fields over here and let you uh, let you fill it in. That's not the way I would do it. But I think you should really understand why. Uh, what what's really the fundamental differences between a linked list and also arrays, and when would be uh when would it be uh would it be expensive to use linked list, and when would it be uh expensive to use arrays? That's something you have to make sure you, you know. That's very fundamental, right? Alrighty, I saw some question over here. Uh, okay, back to the slide uh here. Why is the uh, worst case not n minus one? Because assuming that if you got a reference of of the tail. In which case you can you can definitely do some if if conditional you, you can say if uh the i is exactly equal to n minus one, in that case you can simply return a tail. In in that case it will just be a constant time. It's not a worst case. The worst case would be when uh i is exactly equal to n minus two. In that case you can simply just uh uh well you cannot really go uh like uh, from the tail and go to its previous node. That's not allowed for the uh simply linked list, right? All right, very good. Yeah. In the test, if uh, I didn't really mention that explicitly, you can definitely assume we got the reference to the head and also we got a reference to the tail. You can assume that, right? If I say that you cannot assume it, I'll let you know explicitly. All right. All right, I see this some uh, little discussion over here about doubly linked list over here. So doubly linked list will be the topic for week number five when I release it uh, next week, right? But you don't need to worry about doubly linked list for your written test number one, all right? Otherwise, I think uh, you guys were just maybe just helping each other to clarify, which is okay, good, all right. Okay, let's now talk about a Google Doc. I think uh, uh, a good number of questions, uh, good question over here. I think uh, uh, two or three of them are more like uh, about styles which I can give you my opinion, uh, and then we don't need to spend too much time anyway, okay? And for the first one, I'll dive directly into it. In the lecture, uh, usually I would say, if we got some condition satisfied, we're gonna throw some exception, like an error condition. Otherwise, we can just do normal coding over here without the exception. Basically, this will be the error condition, this will be the normal condition. And your fellow student was asking if they wrote in this way, so they can say, if the error condition is satisfied, throw the exception. So this part here is really the same. You can think about this part here about the error condition is really the same as this one over here. The only difference is whether or not the else is really necessary over here, okay? I would say, I know that many developers like to write it in this way. I think your fellow student really justified quite well in the notes uh, as I quoted over here, because somehow you don't really need to introduce an extra indentation. For the rest uh, for the rest of the code if you do it in this way okay i would say for these two uh it's a really a matter of style i wouldn't say if you choose this way but not this or vice versa would be a best style i think they are equally okay right for me personally i normally like to write the else part over here which in some way may not be so necessary because we know that if you already throw the exception that means you wouldn't be able to reach here anyway so but i like to really say whenever i got if I don't want to miss the else, so I can make sure I always consider all the cases synthetically, right? So I would say this or this are equally fine, right? There's no uh, criticism for each one of them, okay? I would say either is okay. Whichever way you write is fine, all right? That's a very quick uh, clarification for your uh, question, right? Any follow-up? All right, that one should be rather straightforward. Good. Okay, next one. All right, this one here, it might be worth mentioning. I think that your fellow student got very good thought, which is about the at at over here. Okay, this method over here. I think that your fellow student was talking about if, right, remember we actually said if i is equal to zero, 
So that would be the special case where we can simply say at first. And your fellow student was wondering about what if we are talking about to really uh, in, uh, what, what if we are talking about a special case where we can simply call the at last. Special case where we can simply call the at last. Right, I think uh, it is possible. Definitely, it's possible. So what I would suggest is what we can do is we can actually put if the size is actually equal. Uh, sorry, the i. Remember we we're talking about at at right. Let's say for example, if this is a chain of nodes you have, let's say we only got three over here, right? Let's make uh, some illustration over here. And indices will be zero, one, and two. And of course we know the size is actually three, right? And if I try to do at at over here, let's say I want to add at index uh let's say three over here, right? You can see three is exactly equal to the size over here. And then uh, I want to add maybe some string, for example, let's say uh maybe Allen, doesn't matter. All right. All right, so that's kind of the special case we're talking about over here. So three here, which is exactly matching the size. So I think that we can definitely add this special case if you want, right? So I'm putting that here, you can uh, test it out. So after the if over here, so if I is equal to zero, that will be the special case. You will be, we just add the first. And when I is equal to size, we're going to say at last over here, all right? So that will be the new fragment of code. And I think this will be necessary because in this particular case, at last is actually going to updates. So this method over here will update the tail reference properly. All right. I believe the at last is one of the example I gave you guys. I think uh, I think so. Yeah, I don't think I did the at last. I did the at first. I didn't do the at last. But at last should be very similar to at first. Okay. So the at uh so two things I want to oh, conclusion. Okay. The original code I got in the uh the in the lecture notes has some flaw which I didn't really reveal. Okay. So the original over here, it does not not updating tell properly when the uh when e right we talk about element e right when e is inserted as the last elements that's the the flaw in the uh in the pre uh in the previous version uh, which i talk about in the slide right it's not uh it's not really updating the tail properly especially when e is inserted as the last element so that's why to really fix this i'm going to use the idea of your fellow students we're going to add this particular fragment of code to make sure in the special case where size is exactly equal to i right like this example over here in that case, we can simply call the helper method at last, assuming that it exists. So what your fellow student put over there for i minus one, that one is not exactly right. So I think it should be, I think what they meant to say would be i. When, uh, when i is equal to the size, in that case, you're going to uh, insert to the last, right? All right, guys, hopefully that's clear to you, right? Again, the code you have in your slides is not really handling about the tail reference correctly especially when the i over here is exactly equal to the size there's a it's missing an edge case so to really fix it you have to write this fragment of code over here it's a special case which is kind of uh, similar to when we got a special case when i is equal to zero we can simply call the f first similar idea all right all right any follow-up question to this in case it's not clear anybody okay go ahead Okay, I'll pause for a little bit longer in case you want to think about it, but you can definitely try it out uh, to make sure that's really doing the job. Alrighty, assuming that's clear, let me now move on. Okay, all right, so this one over here is also a very good question here. 
Uh, I think your fellows here was wondering about garbage collection. All right, so that's uh, garbage collected. It's a very special term, especially for object-oriented programming language like a Java. So garbage collection is really about automatic man memory management. Automatic memory management. Okay. Um, so let me draw a little bit connection to what you might be studying right now, or you will be studying, maybe then, uh, maybe in the summer term, or maybe next year. So there is a course called EECS uh, 2031. I believe your engineering fellow student will take 2032, right? Anyway, in that course, you learn about the programming language C, which is a so-called lower, more like a closer to the system level language, which is much lower than Java. And one thing you as a programmer, it's more like a double edged sword. So at one on the one hand, you can you have more freedom about how to exploit how to manipulate the memory. On the other hand, if you don't really have discipline about manipulating the memory, you might have so called a memory leak, meaning that you're just wasting the memory without really using that efficiently. Right? That's something I'll leave to your 2031 instructor. But a connection I'd like to draw. I haven't really uh, reviewed uh, the C language myself for a long time, but correct me if I'm wrong. I believe there are uh, like a two uh, functions or keywords you can use. One is called malloc. Okay. The other one is called free. I believe. Okay. Was around along that line. Okay. Basically, the malloc is actually for you to really allocate memory, right? It's called malloc. And the other one. Oh, that's right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you for com confirming. And the other one is about free, okay? I would say you can think about more or less, not exactly, but more or less. You think about Java in this course, or in your 2030 and maybe 1022 or 1021, right? The malloc is a little bit similar to the new keyword you actually use. So whenever you use a new keyword, that means you want to allocate a memory, uh, uh, you, want, you want to allocate some space in the memory to really create some objects, right? It's a little bit similar to malloc. Of course, you can definitely do more things uh, with malloc, which the new keyword cannot. The new keyword in Java or in any uh, OOP is, is very restrictive. You can just create a new objects without anything further, all right? However, in the case of uh, the free over here that you can do in uh, uh, in C, you don't si you simply don't have any correspondence in Java. You don't. Whatever that ha uh, whatever it has to do with the uh, freeing the memory, it has to be done by automatic memory uh, management. That's why you should know, right? It's more like a background knowledge, which I don't normally don't really explicitly mention. I thought you might just run into it yourself anyway, or we could just talk about it, right? Right, so so far I'm talking about for allocating memory in Java, you just you can only use a new keyword, which is pretty restrictive. And whenever you want to uh, maybe deallocate some memory, you cannot really do what you could what you could in a language like C. You just cannot. In some way, that's a good thing because in that way they kind of protect you from maybe uh, somehow messing up with the memory. Right. Anyway, so automatic me memory management. Right. So, but this itself can be an entire course that's very specialized, but we don't really uh, want to do that here. I just want to use this example here to give you some idea about how garbage collection may be working, right? Exactly how that's going to be working, you don't really need to, uh, you don't need to worry too much, all right? But for those of you who are interested, feel free to maybe uh, look for some online resources. There might be some, even, even some maybe specialized handbook on garbage collection uh, that you can uh, look into, right? All right, let me uh, talk specifically about this example here. So this is some fragment of code uh, which I wrote for the remove first, right, in the lecture, right? So you can uh, refer to the remove first, which I talk about. And I actually gave uh, these three lines of code about how to remove the first, right? Let's, let's use, simply use this uh, list, for example, over here, right? But before that, before that, your fellow student was wondering why line number one and line number three would be necessary okay let me just highlight them first of all line number one over here and also line number three over here wouldn't it be nest uh would it be enough just to write line, line number two which would be let me just use uh maybe pink over here right and also your fellow student was claim claiming that just by writing uh line number two 
it will be sufficient for the garbage collector to pick up the old head without line number one and line number three. Okay, let me talk about it, right? I will claim, I, will, I can tell you that line number one and three will be necessary. Let's try to visualize. So let's think about line number one, line number three, and also line number two, right? So what's going to happen if you do line number two? Line number two is actually going to say the head, rather than pointing to over here, is actually going to point to wherever its next will be pointing to, right? Which will be basically this node over here. That one we know pretty well about how to visualize, right? This will be what's going to be achieved by line number two. All right. However, after this, you can see that we still got things like uh, we still got some pointer which will prevent the garbage collector to do uh, from doing something to this particular nodes. Right. Let me just uh, emphasize that this node over here still will not be garbage collected because you can see, especially for this pointer, meaning that somehow this node still depends on this particular chain of nodes over here. So that's a kind of a, they're kind of a still be considered as one compound uh, compound over here by the garbage collector. So that's why this node here is not really standing alone. It's not being isolated. It's not really a so-called uh, orphan object. I'll write it down in a moment. At this point over here, this will not be garbage collected because it still depends on some other existing chain of nodes. So they will not be uh, garbage collected, right? It's not isolated, okay? So at the moment, it will not be uh, not to be garbage collected because it is still not isolated especially this particular pointer i'm pointing out to you this point here over here right this point here over here this one here all right i'm gonna use a different color here especially this point here over here right this one here right and what line number one and line number three over here would do is to make sure we make that particular node isolated. That's what we'll do. Let's see exactly what those two nodes will try to achieve. Those two nodes, number one is trying to, uh, let me use orange over here. Line number one is going to declare some old node, right? So we're going to do some old, old node or old head, doesn't matter. So old node is actually over here, right? And then after we have executed line number two, we're going to say old node. I think uh, your file was not being very consistent. Okay, so maybe they, they, they meant to say old head over here. So I'll do the same. Old head, right, pointing to over here. And that what it really meant was old head. Okay, over here. Right, so line number three is actually going to say all head are set next to be null. That means what they are doing is they are getting rid of this particular pointer over here, right? So the orange part is going to make sure after doing these two steps, line number one and also line number three, after we have done this, this particular node itself will be isolated. There is no other pointer pointing to it, well, except for Allen, but that's okay, it's only a single pointer, but at least. This point, uh, this node over here does not depend on any other node, like the purple one right, we have. But the orange line, number three, has gotten rid of this particular purple line, right? So in this case, I can say that over here, after executing, after line number three, this node, this becomes the so-called orphan node. Yeah, just using the analogy, right? It's uh, what they call orphan node, which will be garbage collected at some point. When exactly, we don't know. It really depends on how Java implements that at the runtime. Garbage collected. All right, so that's about what I want to say. So the conclusion is, uh, the takeaway, not only that you have to make sure you actually do this part over here, which is quite obvious, you want to make sure you set a pointer so that uh, the new head actually now becomes the next one. But also you want to make sure 
the chain of nodes should be a uh, uh, should be only a single linear structure. There should not be any branches. For example, what you really want to make sure is the linear chain of nodes is like a single thread over here, right? Rather than you having some other nodes that's also pointing to some nodes over here, like a like what you have, right? If you didn't really have this one here, right? So you want to make sure this one doesn't really happen, right? So both line number one and line number three will be important, so that the node will be garbage collected at some point. All right. Already, uh, any follow up to this? But as I said, the garbage collection is quite a big subject, which we don't really have to worry too much. You can just you can just assume that somehow it will be done behind the scenes. But for you as a programmer, you want to make sure you can set the you can really decrease the dependency as much as possible from your end. Right, that's something. Uh, well, of course, if you only do your programming assignments, if the the test cases wouldn't really specify this, you might do it without uh, receiving any penalty. But you want to make sure you understand it because in the written test, maybe it will require that you actually do such steps like a one and three to make sure you actually uh, decrease the the counts of dependency so that it becomes an orphan node. All right. Um, professor. Right. Please go ahead. Um, if we got rid of that old head node and it it's like not attached to anything anymore, but let's say I wanted to keep it for like reference in the future, yep. I could just make a new node and point to that, but it's no longer part of like my original chain, yep. right? Good, good question. Let's say if you really want to keep this node over here, the uh, the best way to do it is you may, uh, okay, let me just make it clear to you. Okay. If you really want to keep it, you want to make, uh, you want to have some global variable pointing to it. You don't really need to create a new node. You don't need to. Okay. Let's say we are now in, let's say the class simply link list over here. For example, let's say you have some node over here. Let's say old head. Let's say that's an attribute. So that's more at the class level across the methods. And the method that we are talking about is the remove first. So that'll be the remove uh, first over here, right? That's the void method in the same class, right? In the context. And over here, what you can do is you can simply say the old head is simply assigned to the existing head. And then you can do whatever that's really required. So this line over here will make sure this particular old head this particular old head over here is actually a global variable, which means it should exist without being garbage collected between the methods. That's what you should do. Does it make sense to you? But then if old head equals head and then we are changing head to the next node, then wouldn't old head also change? No, it wouldn't change. Well, that's, uh, that's another good question here, but I'm a bit surprised. But anyway, you should know this. Okay, So think about what's happening over here. When you say, let me be clear over here. Let's say the node old head is equal to head over here. And then you say head is assigned to head dot get next. The analogy would be if you got, let's say, for example, integer i is equal to, let's say, 23, let's say integer j is equal to 46, right? If you say i is equal to j, first of all, and then you say j plus plus, okay? So can you just oh, tell right. me? I, I yeah, right? You, you can see an analogy yeah. over here, right? Yeah, don't forget. Right. Over here, when you say j plus plus, you wouldn't really change the value of i at the same time. You only change what's really in j. So similar idea, right? So after this, of course, after this, i will still be uh, just 46. And also j will, st uh, will just be 47, right? You can see there. Are, so the plus plus over here is not, it's not going to impact about the i. Similar idea over here. So what you're doing here, you can try to visualize exactly what's happening here. So when you say the o hat over here, uh, there are two ways for you to visualize. Let's do both of them. Let's say currently head is actually pointing to some node over here, right? So when you say old head is really pointing to head, 
at the moment, both of them are pointing to the same node. And now when you say head is really pointing to head again next, what you're doing is you're really redirecting this arrow over here to something else. You're not really touching this. That's one way to see it. Another way to see it would be when you say uh, another way, when you say all head is really assigned to head, you're basic, uh, think about there's basically storing addresses, right? So when you say old head is actually, uh, this will be like old head, it's like a box for storing addresses. And this will be the head, right? So let me just make uh, some address, let's say address one. And also address two, right? Over here, when you say the old head is really assigned to head, that means uh, you're copying this address over here into here, address one. So now they are really pointing to the same objects, meaning that they're storing the same addresses. And now when you try to say head is assigned to uh, head again next, you're only replacing this uh, address over here by another address, maybe address number three. Whereas we are not really changing whatever that's over here, right? They are not really interfering with each other. So these are, these are the two ways for you to think about. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Awesome. I think that's very important, of course. Yeah. Alrighty. All right, guys, any follow up to this? Uh, either to this or to the uh, garbage collection kind of stuff over here, right? Well, the take home message will be you should do this kind of stuff yourself. You should. All right, let's see if there's any follow up. Uh, on the chat or maybe uh okay okay good okay let me go on to the next one and the next one over here it's uh about let's see okay kind of similar this one you can think about this one somehow just by uh, by co use this these two questions are just like a follow-up uh this will be the follow-up to the previous one okay this might be a good exercise over here i can uh, i will tell you the answer in a moment but Let's say we want to remove a node from a singly linked list, right? And and you can think about this is one of one of the exercises I assigned to you uh, in the lecture, right? So pretty much like a remove at uh, remove the node at. So that will be the void remove at maybe integer i over here. And of course, I should be a valid index. It should be between zero and also the size of the uh, uh, list minus one, right? It should be about this, right? That's the error condition, okay? Right? So your fellow student was basically asking about how can we remove that particular node so that we uh, we don't really uh, really uh, try to hold up a memory that can be uh, freed, right? We, we, we don't want to really hold up any unnecessary me uh, memory that's not needed anymore. That's what we want to do. Right, let me give you some context over here, and then I want you to think about exactly what you have to write over here. Right, let's not go over that. Let's say you got your method over here, remove at, at a particular index i. And then if i is either negative or larger than or equal to the size, that'll be an invalid index, or we got some error. Maybe throw some illegal argument exception, right? Otherwise, we're going to do something very similar to at at right remember we talk about the uh, the method in the lecture at at it will be kind of similar similar okay what you need is you will need a previous note well if you actually want to uh, remove the note at index i you better have access to the note at index i minus one so that's why i put i minus one over here right it will be necessary okay and then i just call this previous note so now you can look at the diagram over here right Think about, in general, this will be the chain of nodes you have, right? And the previous node over here is basically the node at index i minus one. And the one we want to remove is at index i over here, right? So now, assuming that you already got access to the previous node, and of course, if you want to talk about the runtime, the running time, this line alone is already going to dominate the rest, right? Similar to the at node at. Because you can see here, by calling the get node at, and we simply got i minus one. And this one here is gonna be linear for sure, in the, in the worst case, right? It's gonna be big O of n already, but that's okay. So 
So now the question is, what exactly should we write over here to complete the implementation for removal? Right? I already got a solution over here, but before I reveal it, I would like you guys to maybe give a try to see if you know how to do it. I think I got some similar example question over there. You can definitely look into to, to think about different uh, scenarios. Right? So what should we write over here? The only variable you would need will be just the previous. That's all you need, right? Well, actually, you might need some, uh, so something along the line of what we talk about over here, right? But what exactly should you write over here to remove this uh, node at index i? What should you do? Anyone? I'll pause a moment and for you guys to think about, right? Yeah, pause for just one moment and then you can uh, think about. Already. You should really write three lines over here. And if you kind of understood what I made, uh, what I discussed in the previous question, this one should be quite straightforward to do. Anybody? Yeah, if you're still not feeling exactly confident about writing this, I think uh, that might mean you want to review harder about your lecture, right? About the singly linked list, because that would be something that you need uh, for the written test. All right. I'll pause for one moment. Uh, if nobody, then uh, I can just tell you the answer. That's fine. All right, pretty good. I got something uh, like a previous dot next is uh it's equal to i i dot next. Yeah, well, i over here is integer, right? How can you say integer dot next? Right. So along that line, and from Philip, uh, previous dot set next, previous dot get next dot get next. That seems promising. Let's see. uh let's see over here actually not exactly over here let me just reveal that let's talk talk about it okay yeah so this will be actually what you need to do all right let's now go over that i think what philip said over there i think that, that was uh correct very nice all right okay so first of all we're going to say previous no over here that said next to be what should be its next? It should be previous dot get next dot get next. Previous dot get next dot get next is really referring to whatever this is over here, which could be potentially null, but that's okay. So what we're doing over here is rather than pointing to over here, it's actually going to point to over here. All right? So that's what this line would do. All right. And then the next two lines is really for garbage uh, garbage collection purpose over here, right? You want to make sure you also try to reset this particular node as much as possible over here, right? That's what you should do. However, you can see if I now say previous.getNext over here, am I actually able to get to this node anymore? I'm not really able to, right? Because you can see the previous.getNext has already been set to this particular node already. But I want to check this one here, right? So that's really something that's not exactly right. And I want you to do an exercise over here, fix this. Fix this so as to set the node at index, sorry, I'm writing out of space. I'm gonna put, put it here. At index i for garbage collection. All right, that's something you should do. So maybe what you should do is you want to actually introduce maybe some extra variable called old head, but that's not a very good name, but you just need some maybe extra variable to make sure you actually store that reference before you set the next for the previous, All right? That's something you should. All right, so guys, it's clear about the discussion over here, right?
this line over here is actually correct. That's okay. However, these two lines are not exactly right because somehow the previous dot get next has been set already. All right? So that's something you want to do. So you may just want to have some temporary or in, uh, another extra variable to really do the right thing, right? So that'll be the exercise for you. All right. All right, any follow up to this discussion? Anyone? Any follow up? Anybody? Yeah, I hope so far it makes sense, right? If it doesn't, that means uh, you may want to study more about the lecture and maybe uh, come to my office hour. It makes sense. Very good. Awesome. Good. Awesome. Very good. All right, guys, I'll pause for one more moment uh, in case you are still thinking and if you still want to ask me follow up. From Philip. So we need to create another node and point to uh, previous node. I think uh, you need another node, for example. Basically, you want to make sure you really keep previous that get next, right? That's something you really want to keep. So what you may want is another reference over here. Call that maybe uh, maybe uh, the old next, right? I think that's what you need, right? <laughs> I already tell you the solution for the exercise, right? Yeah, exactly. What well, like what Ali is uh, suggesting in the chat, right? I think uh, you want to make sure you actually got this reference over here before you actually execute this line. So after executing this line, you can you still have the access to this node by using this reference over here, and then you can set its next to be null, and also you can set its uh, element to be null as well, right? Just to reset it. Right, that's basically a solution for the exercise. But I would I would suggest if you're not too sure, give it a try. You know, write it in the Java code. Right. One potential trap I can share with you guys is because uh well sometimes to really understand the algorithm for linked list conceptually it's just by drawing diagram. So but some at some sometimes it's also quite easy to create an illusion for you. You thought you really understood exactly what's going on, but you should never be so convinced until you can write it into code and also test it. That's my suggestion, right? In the actual test, you definitely want to make sure you really want to, uh, 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 you know, uh, make sure you understand how to draw diagram to get a conceptual idea and also write, uh, turn that into code. Both are important. Yeah, for Mickey, we should have more time on the test to draw diagrams. Yeah, you know, I think uh, we still remain that to be 30 minutes. But on the other hand, I think the number of questions I'll give to you guys, I will definitely consider that you may have to visualize what's going on for sure. Yeah. Yeah, of course, you know, we definitely will give you time to draw diagram, but it should not really take forever for you to draw either, right? So I think uh, just make sure you're as proficient as possible. Uh, drawing diagrams, you know, to really make sure you know understand what's going on. But of course, not necessarily every question will require uh, to draw diagram. Not necessarily. Yeah. Alrighty. All right. Let's now move on to the next one. I believe uh, that's the last question. But this one is a very interesting one. Okay. That one basically it's about generics, and this is something we didn't really talk about in the lecture. So I would say, uh, as far as your written test one is concerned, this part here is not going to be covered, right? In case you're worried, okay? But I think it's good for your knowledge. If I do decide to make it covered, make it to be covered by later test or exam, I'll let you guys know. But I think it's very good knowledge to know, okay? First of all, not covered by written test number one, right? So you don't just learn about this a new concept. It's a very natural extension to what we learn about generics. Now covered by uh, written test number one, right? Number one, okay. And you can feel free to re maybe refer to your fellow students' uh, question over here. I think that's pretty clear, but let me just give you one complete example. I'll give you the code as well to really know what's going on over there, okay? All right, I also got some exercise to do together, right? Okay, let's say this. We got three classes over here, all right? We have one class called person. We have a subclass of person called students, right? You can see student extends person, right? If you want to draw a diagram just to make sure you understand the relationship, you can think about the person is over here. And then 
inherited by another class called students. And at the person level, we declare to say every person you can ask them about their BMI, right? Uh, for those of you who don't know, BMI is the body uh, mass index. I think it's uh, your uh, your height divided by I forgot actually I forgot I forgot about the formula. It's something about maybe your weight divided by divided by height square, something like that. Anyway, so it's a get BMI. Yeah. You may have done this example many times already in maybe in different courses for BMI. So you might know uh, just know the formula, right? So we define the we declare the get BMI method here in a person, and also we declare get tuition over here, right? So exactly uh, what I'm what I'm gonna uh, what I'm going to talk about right now is related to what you learn in twenty thirty the advanced OOP course about static type and also expectation, right? For those of you who took a 2030 with me, that should not be a very strange term. But of course, if you didn't take 2030 with me, you should also know. It's just about very basic about what method you can call, uh, depending on what the static type is for the variable. But let me give you this example here. Right, that's our setup. We got a person, we got students being a subclass, right? Let's say now we got a class that should be generic, but now you can see I do a little bit more syntax over here. That's valid. Not only that, it's E. We're saying that whatever E you instantiate this. So what we are saying is here. Whatever class instantiating E must be a subclass of person somehow you can you can kind of guess what the meaning is when you look at the decoration here right since we're using also the extends keyword over here right so we're saying that e should be instantiated into some uh class what well, what we said before it could be node of string node of integer but now you cannot do that anymore because now we are saying that e can only be instantiated by some subclass of person right so that means the consequence would be if you try, for example, you, you if you try the note of string, or if you try the note of integer, right? If you try either, it's not going to work anymore because string does not extend person, and integer does not extend person, right? Hopefully that's uh, makes sense, right? And knowing this. We know that uh, every reference to E in the class is going to, so you can see once we declare the E over here, every occurrence of E over here, uh, I think uh, that's about it, okay? So we're saying that element should be of type E, and also the next node should also be storing E, right? And we're saying that whatever E that has been instantiated, in this case, there's, there are only two possibility. Either the person itself, because the person is a subclass of itself, well, like a descendant class. And also person, uh, also students by definition, also is a subclass of person, right? So both are okay, right? So we got element, we got next, right? And here we got get BMI over here. So now you can see this dot element over here. Let me just do this example together and I was, oh, we can do some exercise. This dot element over here, you can see what's the static type for element? The static type for element is simply just E. And what we know is E is guaranteed to be a descendant class of person, meaning that you will be able to call whatever that's declared in the person class, which will be get BMI. So that's why you can call get BMI directly, All right? This might be something you didn't know before. So I'm just telling you, it's possible to really let your generic parameter over here to be constrained somehow to some inheritance hierarchy so that's why it's called constraint generosity which we didn't talk about of course right that's for your knowledge are you guys okay so far about what i'm talking about i hope sir go ahead um so basically uh this allows us to be generic but for like us the constrained hierarchy like if we want to get uh -huh. attributes that only belong inside that hierarchy That's but we exactly want to right. use 
yes. any method like in that like list that tree exactly that's spot on there's a spot okay. on observation let me rephrase a little bit yeah I, I think you're pretty much right so we are saying that uh if you only got e over here like what we did in the lecture that means e can be instantiated to any class you like including objects person uh string account or integer anything however if you actually got e over here well you can uh, I, i'll try that together with you guys okay if i simply got rid of this hypothetically when i say this the element over here all i know is it's going to be statically just e which can be anything like objects so i cannot call get bmi anymore i cannot on the other hand if i put this constraint generosity syntax over here i say extends person so what we uh, what a compiler will assume is whatever class you use to instantiate an e is guaranteed to be a, a descendant class of person in which case the get bmi method is guaranteed to be available right let me show it to you right away okay so i'm going to make available the source code for you because because i think it's really useful knowledge for you to know uh i got the node i got a person i got a student already right what i talk about under the model package so if i go to the node you can see i got extends person right and also if i go to uh oh yeah exactly here you can see the get bmi method here at the moment when i say this the elements elements statically is e which is guaranteed to be a descendant class of person so that's why i can say get bmi right and let's try to experiment this right away what if i took out this part over here synthetically is still okay right you can see this is just how we did the node decoration from the lecture but now we cannot assume anything uh, about the hierarchy anymore about the e so that's why if you move on uh, move to this uh, part to get bmi you will simply say get, get bmi is undefined for the type e because right now this dot element over here is of type e but e is uh general we simply don't know uh what you will be constrained to so that's why you will, will not compile right hopefully that's clear so far all right so let me put it back right that's one thing i'd like you to try once you get a source code what we can do is a little exercise over here right so knowing about this let me go back here okay i can let you guys think about it for minutes just to make sure you can, you can reinforce the understanding let's say in the same class we want to define a method called get tuition right so i'll simply say i'll define some tuition and then return tuition first of all can i write something like this can i simply say tuition is assigned to i'll just say element rather than this the element to save some space elements which is referring to here dot get tuition all right let's talk about this line if that works then we are done would this work if no or yes justify anyone when i say would it work would, um, it, would it at least compile yeah go ahead please i think it will work as long as as we say that it extends person okay that's okay uh but let me challenge you a little bit okay when we say uh element over here we know that the static uh as for, think about your compiler imagine that right the compiler is going to judge whether a single line is going to compile or not what do we know about this element this element here statically is going to be e that's what we know and the e is going to be guaranteed to be extending from person which can be person itself or any uh descendant classes of person right so e can be any descendant class of person including person itself that's what we know knowing this do you think get tuition should be available or not but you thought it should be right or you want to change your mind never mind i changed my mind <laughs> okay good my mind. awesome yeah good good i think once you can you kind of can see what, what what i'm trying to lead you to right always you want to think about what information has been declared in the class that the compiler knows about so anything that compiler doesn't know you cannot assume it right so here since we know i think uh masato actually tried to ex explain over there pretty good 
Since we know E can only be assumed to be a descendant class of person, including person itself. But in the case of person, we only got get B and my declared. We don't have get tuition. Get tuition is only a method that's introduced at a special type, uh, like a specialized type of person, right? So that's why we cannot really do it. Now, guys, test your knowledge about uh, from 2030. Knowing that this is not going to compile, okay? Not going to compile because element is uh, the get tuition is simply not available at the uh, the person level, right? Let me just double check, right? And then we'll talk about how to deal with it. Uh, let me go back to Eclipse over here. So if I simply say tuition is assigned to uh, this uh, elements dot over here, you can see even when you, when you do that in Eclipse, the only suggestion you have is get me a mind. They don't really have to have to get tuition for you. So if you really try over here, it's going to say get tuition is simply not available, undefined for the uh, constraint type E, right? So it's not going to work. I'm going to put it over here so you can remember not working, not compiling. All right, so here I'm going to ask you guys, how do we fix it? If I really want to say, well, in the case where the E happens to be uh, somehow like a something like a class I can call gate tuition, I want to call that. Otherwise, I can return minus one, right? I think you'd have to define get tuition in the person class. Uh, let's say we cannot do that. That's, that's a good suggestion too. Let's say we don't want to do that. <laughs> let's say these two classes are fixed. Let's say we, we cannot change them, yeah. All right, I got something from chat, but let's say Ali, go ahead, please. Oh, hi, Jackie. Hi. So in 2030, uh, we did stuff with the, the wildcard. So there was a way, I forgot the syntax, but there was a way you basically say, uh -huh. I want E to be the E to be a student, and I want E, and E could be any super type of student. So I think it's like question mark super student or something. I've, I don't really remember the syntax. You mean, okay, can you say that again? Uh, did you take 2030 with me? Or I guess other instructor, right? No, I took with Marzia. But there's a wild card, which you can do in the generic. The wild card. Question mark, super student, I believe. Something like that. But you're saying that it can be a student class or student type and any uh, parent of a student type. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, okay. So wild card is actually another story for generics, which we don't have to touch today. Okay. So the issue right now is, the person over here is telling is telling you, all you know about E is that E is going to be some class in this particular hierarchy starting from person. The person really corresponds to person over here, meaning that it can be person, it can be students. But in the case where it is person, we just cannot call get tuition. It's only available later, right? But now how can we somehow to check whether it's really a student or not? Right, I can see from N from the chat, we got to do instance off, right? Not instance off can definitely be helpful to make sure the type over here is really some uh, is really a type that can really make it make the get tuition available, right? That's one thing. That's not enough. We got to do instance off, and also we got to do some typecast, right? That's also something we got to do. Right, let me mention that. And if you guys actually forgot about the details for what you learned in 2030, too bad. I think uh, you know use this chance to review a little bit. I think uh, we you don't really have to worry about this. Maybe at least for your written test number one. I think uh, there will be something that uh, we will have to um, we will have to uh, have to know later when we talk about different uh, types in the data structure. Right, that maybe around that time we can review this once more. Okay, Masato got it. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I think Masato, basically his idea is pretty good. Yeah, I think uh, to really uh, program that, we have to use instance of and also uh, the check uh, and typecast. Right, let me just program that directly. Okay, let's do it over here. So what you got to do is you want to say if the E over here happens to be an instance of the student class, Right? In that case, we can do a cast, right? In that case, let's see over here what's really here. It cannot be resolved to a var variable. Sorry, element. 
beg your pardon? Yeah, <laughs> don't forget for the instance of syntax, you should really put on the left-hand side some variable. Sorry, let me do it again. So the elements over here, basically the element is referring to the attribute element over here, right? You want to make sure it is actually uh, a subclass of students, in which case the get tuition will be available, all right? In that case, we can now do the cast. Well, we can say tuition. Let me just write one possible syntax, right? So now I can uh, try to cast it. I can try to cast the element to be a student because I know it's an instance of that. It's an anonymous cast, right? Once I do that, I can say get dot get tuition. It's now available, all right? Otherwise, maybe I'm, I'm pretty sure I spent some other wrong. There we go. Otherwise, we're gonna say maybe tuition is assigned to minus one, right? So this will be one possible solution. It's a very quick uh, example re in response to your fellow student's question, right? But I think uh, as far as written test number one is concerned, you don't have to worry about this, but I think uh, since you, you have gone such a long way uh, learning about Java, I think uh, you want to make sure this is something that wouldn't be so strange to you, right? especially combining with uh, uh, generics. I think, uh, yeah, so I'll leave that uh, as an example for you. I will give you the source code, play with it. I think it's good for your Java knowledge. If somehow this has to be tested in a future test or exam, I'll let you know explicitly. But I think that you should really know this no matter what. All right, I'm gonna, uh, before I conclude about, uh, if I, before I go on to the next one, do you guys got any question about this? Anybody? Anyone? Feel free. All right, of course, if I try to reveal the answer over here, Oops, sorry, let me do it again. There we go. What I want to do is delete it. <laughs> okay, it's a bit tricky here. But anyway, that's the uh, a solution, all right? Exactly what you just type, all right? But if you want to know the original question from your fellow student, you can definitely read it. So I'll let you read it. I'm, I'm not gonna waste your time, okay? Already, uh, any more questions about this one here? Already, uh, we got only about five minutes before the end. Uh, okay, here, why do we cast it again? Okay, good question here. Remember 2030, right? We, we said that if you actually try to do your cast without doing instance off, you might simply just write into a class cast exception. So you want to make sure every time you try to cast a variable, you definitely want to make sure you do the instance of check to make sure it's safe to do so. That's number one. And why do we need a cast? If you didn't do the cast over here, the static type for elements is only E, in which case it's really on the top of person, which does not have get uh, tuition. That's, so that's why we need a cast, right? So we only do this cast once. And this line over here does not do any cast. It's only checking that you will be safe to, to do the cast. All right, so hopefully, Sarah, I hope that's, that's okay for you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, E here would not be enough for you to call the get tuition because E is only guaranteed to be the person or its descendants, right? Awesome, good. Alrighty, uh, I think we only got three minutes left. I don't think I will have really enough time today to really go over the solution to the problem with you. I'm pretty sure you want to know the solution. Stay tuned. Either wake up early tomorrow to attend the 8.30 session or just watch the recording tomorrow. I'm going to talk about a solution tomorrow for sure. But let me just say something here. Uh, uh, do you guys got, uh, if you got any uh, more questions related to your lecture, uh, your written test, written, written test one coverage, Try to drop by tomorrow in the Q&A. I can definitely handle that. Otherwise, I'm just going to go over the solution for that uh, linked list problem. I think uh, understanding a solution of that one there can also help your written test number one, right? Uh, ju -ju -ju. Let's see, for Philip, is it okay to take size of the problem exercise or we have to handle that the other way? I think, uh, uh, yeah, okay, let me speak a little bit. Uh, okay, 
So guys, to be honest with you, this I was I was a little bit surprised that this problem over here somehow was treated as like a median level problem by the lead code because I don't think that one is really difficult, right? If you understood about how to get size, like what Philip mentioned, if you understand about how to count cal uh, calculate the size, if you understand how to insert at, then you're pretty much done for this particular uh this uh, exercise over here, okay? So I would say uh, if you really want to attend the session tomorrow or watch the recording, I would say it will be the most beneficial for you to really go over this uh, problem specification over here about the unit tests and then try to do it by yourself. I also gave you the starter package, the starter test, uh, sorry, the starter project. Go to your lectures page and then you will see under the problems for week number four, right? Download this uh, for, for this particular Java project over here. Download it and import it to Eclipse, and then you can uh, give yourself maybe 20 minutes and try the problem, try to solve it, right? And see what you can get. And tomorrow, I'm going to talk about some design rationale and then go over the solution and do some tracing with uh, the session, your Session E uh, fellow students, okay? I think for this problem over here, since you're only given the list node class, so the list node class itself does not have the uh, size attributes. So I think uh, you 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 just have to you only got one this this method to code. So everything you want to do, you got to code it up in that particular method. So I think uh, you have to calculate somehow the size of the chain. I think you have to. Yeah, I think uh, somehow you want to calculate to see exactly what will be the precise index to really uh, remove. Right? I'll leave that to you. But I would say if you understood about how to do add at, or if you did an exercise before about remove at, you should be able to solve this problem. And you know, you should really feel proud because this is already considered as a median level problem for, for lead code, which is pretty good. You know, to me it's not that difficult. I mean, I mean to you guys, it should not be too difficult given what we have taught in the lecture, right? But of course, to really make sure it works, right? You want to you will, I want to make sure it's precise and it pass all the test cases, right? I think I should really, uh, 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 really uh, uh, call it a day. All right, guys. Again, thank you for coming today. I think uh, we uh, clarify many things today. And if you got any further questions, come by tomorrow. And otherwise, uh, just watch out the recording. All right. All right, guys. You have a good evening. Uh, I will see you later. Take care. Bye bye.